hope everybody's good and caffeinated. And uh, our next speaker will be David Huber. So go ahead and take it away. All right. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, so um, the work I'm going to present today is, is not something that I've done in the past. It's sort of been a side project for a while. Uh, and Randy heard a version of it about a year ago. Um, and I was interested, so I'm going to sort of give you an update on things. I have zero publications in this area. I do not study spatial navigation. Um, I'm finally getting to the point where I'm ready to write something up, and it would be great to get some feedback. Um, but then this, this idea is a little bit crazy, uh, following the Randy's footsteps. Um, <laughs> and I actually attempted on some of the things that he talked about. Uh, and we'll go part of the way towards addressing that question of how you represent number or quantity in the brain. Um, and so, I mean, in general, what I study is memory and perception, and I study those uh, topics with humans doing behavioral tasks. We look at accuracy, reaction time, uh, and we build computational models. Uh, and so, part of what I've done in the past, what I do have publications in, is, is, is with the topic of memory modeling. Um, and when I first learned about grid cells, it, it, I was fascinated by their regularity and sort of seemed to fly in the face of how we usually think about how the brain um, represents information. So we, you know, we all know about receptive fields, and we know that neurons have a preferred stimulus. Well, here we have these neurons that seem to have many preferred stimuli. So how can that be? How does that fit in with things? And what early on I had this idea, well, maybe Maybe we have the wrong idea about receptive fields, and really what, the, what we're seeing here is kind of an artifact of feedback. Uh, and so that's how we come to <coughs> this memory model of the representation. And I should say, so at some point I realized I was way over my head in terms of literature, and I started consulting with Trey Grace Holstad. Uh, so he got his PhD with the Mosers, uh, who discovered grid cells, and he's kind of steered me in the right direction in terms of what were the important results. So one way you can put this sort of big picture question here is, what is the function of the medial temporal lobe? So you have these brain structures you know, that include the, the hippocampus, but also include the surrounding cortex. Uh, and on the one hand, there's, there's lots of evidence to support that what, they, what these structures do is spatial navigation. And this is largely coming from the rodent literature, uh, electrophysiology literature. So we have hippocampal plate cells that we already heard a bit about. Uh, and then we also have these different kinds of entorhinal cells. Uh, so one we didn't hear about, and I'll tell you about, are called border cells. Uh, and then there's also head direction cells. We heard about those. Uh, grid cells. And then you have head direction grid cells. They're conjunctive. So they, they are a grid cell, but only when the animal's head is pointed in a particular direction. Now, on the other hand, if you look in the, in the human literature, um, it would suggest that these brain structures are involved in episodic memory. We all know, you know the classic example of HN uh, having uh, his hippocampus and surrounding cortex removed in surgery, and he couldn't create new memories. Um, but we also know that the surrounding cortical areas are involved in other kinds of memory. For instance, the parahippocampus has been implicated in terms of a sense of familiarity, uh, and the parietal cortex has been implicated in, in terms of object familiarity. But how do we reconcile these two views? <coughs> of what these structures are doing. Um, well, so the, the approach we take here is to say that what a memory is, is a point in a high dimensional space. So it's, it's of such high dimensions that you are unlikely to revisit exactly that circumstance again in your life. Uh, and so you can sort of think about memories as dropping breadcrumbs. Right, so if we know the story of Hansel and Gretel, uh, they're being let out in the forest to be left to die, uh, and they needed to, you know, so, so um, uh, it was it was uh, Hansel who realized you know he needed to find his way back, so he started dropping his breadcrumbs. But he didn't know um, that a bird was eating them behind him, <laughs> so essentially he was an amnesic. <laughs> uh, but basically, that you can think about that's so you're sort of dropping down these memories so you can remember where you've been. And we know that um, that you know location is a very important cue, uh, an important attribute of memories. Uh, so one of the classic mnemonic techniques is the method of loci. Uh, basically, you, if you know um, 
some sort of spatial arrangement of things, you can associate all of the elements in that spatial arrangement with something you're trying to remember. What you might not know is the story of where this method comes from. Uh, so this was, there was a banquet for the Greek poet Simonides, uh, and at some point he was called away from the banquet. And there was an earthquake, and it crushed and killed everyone at the banquet. Their bodies were mangled beyond recognition. Uh, but when he came back, they needed to figure out which body was which, and he remembered the arrangement of where people were sitting. <laughs> so he knew, oh, this mangled body must be Fred. Fred was sitting to my left. <laughs> Uh, and that's where the, the method of blows that comes from. But so the, the point is, <laughs> um, the spatial positions are a powerful memory cube. Okay. So I'll go through this quickly because we've already had a bit of this um, from the other talks. So uh, place cells are cells that selectively respond to one location within some arena. So you have you have a rat uh, in some box, uh, and the rat runs around while you're recording. Uh, from the hippocampus, um, and so the little gray lines are the path the rat took, and the red dots are action potentials from that cell, uh, and we can turn that into that heat map you see there in blue. So it prefers one location. Okay, so um, the thing that was found that the most was discovered are these grid cells. They don't prefer one location, they prefer multiple locations, and they hadn't been discovered in the past because they hadn't really tried large enough boxes. And so they used the larger box and suddenly they saw these sort of multiple hot spots uh, from, and then they, you find them predominantly in the um, medial ventral cortex. Uh, and so the, the, the original studies were done with a circular arena, you know, but you've done with all kinds of different arenas since then. Uh, and they, the hot spots are arrayed in these very precise hexagonal grid. Okay. So um, there's some other properties of grid cells. The, uh, so you can you can characterize them in terms of their spacing, which is the distance between the hot spots uh, in this hexagonal grid, uh, in terms of the orientation. And so different grid cells might have a slightly different orientation. From each. They might be tilted one way or the other. And in terms of the spatial phase. So if you look, you're recording from one cell, and it has its grid cell arrangement. And if you, if you record from the anatomical neighbor, it will uh, it'll have the same uh, spacing and orientation, but it'll be a shifted phase. Okay. So my uh, collaborator on this, Chris Solstad, one of his landmark uh, contributions to the literature is to discover these border cells. So these are cells, also an endurant cortex, um, that they respond when the animal is close to one of the walls of the arena, and it's. It, Specifically, it's an allocentric, so it'll be, you know, this is a cell that is preferring the east border. Uh, and it doesn't matter, it's really about the border, if you put the animal in a different arena, you know, sort of stretched in one direction, it still prefers that side of things. You do it in the y direction as well. Okay. Now there's other endorhinal cells that prefer um, a particular head direction. And again, this is allocentric. So this will be a cell that whenever the animal's head is pointed in the northeast direction, uh, it fires more. And so you get a circular representation for this for these kind of a head direction cells. And then finally you also have, like I, I mentioned, you have these grid cells that are conjunctive with head direction. And so they, they're a grid, but only when the animal's head is pointed in a particular allocentric direction. Okay. So now one of the things that's sort of striking if you look in this literature, so you can sort of survey these cells in these different brain regions. And if you look in the medial and adrenal cortex, which is sort of the, the main gateway to the hippocampus, and you, and you classify the cells, uh, you see that maybe around 10% of them are, are border cells. If you say how many of them are grid cells in the medial and adrenal cortex, it seems to be that, uh, that about half the cells are grid cells. So it's, it's really, it's remarkable. It, it's like most of what's going into the hippocampus is either grid cells or border cells. And this really strongly supports that, okay, hippocampus is involved in spatial navigation. Uh, and so then you can also look at, of those grid cells, the percent that are also sensitive to head direction, and maybe about half of them are. So there's a lot of head direction uh, grid cells going in. Okay. So, uh, 
Um, so I mean, the, the question is, how, how can this be the case if what the hippocampus is primarily doing is, is storing memories? So how do we reconcile? Well, so there's, there's been a lot of computational effort to try to, ex to explain these grid cells. And I'm going to sort of just roughly summarize uh, what's been done. Um, the, the sort of first wave of grid cells were um, path integration models. They basically say that, you know, it's really tempting to say that what these grid cells are is essentially a 2D 4A analysis. Uh, and so, because the way in which those sort of shifted in terms of phase. Um, so that's what these path integration models did. And so you can sort of see that you're going to build up your place or rep representation from combinations of grid cells. Um, however, there's recent results that really fly in the face of this approach. Okay, um, and I just have to say more about that, but it's coming from, you can do things like inactivate the hippocampus, um, or so, oh, sorry, you can do things like um, disrupt the grid cell pattern, but it doesn't necessarily affect quite cell results. Okay, um, there's another sort of class of models that are sort of developed, what are called developmental models, and they, they basically say that the, that the grid cells are built from place cells. And because there is, there is evidence actually that developmentally the place cells exist prior to the grid cells. Um, so the, uh, the problem that I see with these models is they don't really assign a function to the grid cell, that the grid cells are sort of like a dangling appendage. Um, and so the approach we're going to say here, this new proposal, uh, is, to, is to feel the feedback. To say that you know that the, the hippocampus is primarily representing memories, and an important attribute of memory is spatial location, and that this is a two-way street between the inputs and feedback from the hippocampus back to the inputs. And then the, then the question is, can this make from this approach? Can we make sense of this uh, very regular pattern we see in terms of grid cells? And so, in this model, the real spatial inputs are border cells and head direction. Uh, and what I'm going to propose is that grid cells might not be about spatial encoding. Uh, and that, that their response might actually be kind of an artifact about how the experiments are done. So these animals are put into an arena that does not have landmarks. Uh, it's just a very, you know, just a square box to avoid any landmarks. And that there will be attributes that are common to the whole arena. Uh, and that what the grid cells might actually be representing are those attributes and that they selectively receive feedback in certain locations. Okay. So the attributes are remembered in certain locations. So that's the, it's the um, position is triggering memory retrieval, just like in the method of what's up. Okay. So this, mod, this proposal, we're going to say that the true feedforward receptive field of the grid cells is unimodal. Uh, and capture some attribute that was not actually considered by the experimenters. They didn't manipulate something. So let's say, for instance, the, there's the temperature of the arena in which the animal is in. And that's constant across the whole arena. They didn't manipulate temperature to find the receptive field properties in terms of temperature. Okay. And so the different hotspots reflect uh, memory retrieval in, in, that are, that's retrieved by the spatial cues of particular positions. So for instance, you have, you know, here's one place cell uh, that feeds back to an antiviral cell. You remember something there, and then you move, and you remember something there. You move to another location, another place cell provides feedback and remember something there, and so on, until you get your good cell representation going to this, this feedback. Okay, and so one of the properties of these grid cells is their, is their regular lattice. And so that's sort of, you know, why is it regular? Why is it in this triangular shape? Okay. And so what I'm going to propose is the reason it's regular is to allow for an efficient population code. Okay. And so I'm going to, I'm going to take a stab at this by trying to develop a numerical representation of sorts. Uh, and so here I'm showing you a basis set. So this is a basis set of half sign. <coughs> tuning curves. So essentially this is, so I'm showing you that there's 12 of these cells that are preferring particular allocentric positions. So essentially think of it as like how, it's a saying how far am I, you know, it, it's a cell that likes to be a certain distance from an east border or a certain distance from a west border. 
And so we, uh, if, if we uh, are align them very regularly spaced like this from east to west, and so the gray, gray bars are showing you the actual borders that might exist in the arena, we can retrieve uh, positions from a population code of this. And, and more specifically, so the, the blue line, I mean, uh, right, so this blue line here is showing you when you put in a particular east-west position, whether or not you can properly recover and represent that based upon a weighted combination of these basis set cells. And in particular, the, the rule for this weighted combination is to say, what, what is the meaning? What, what is the preferred position of the cell? Uh, and then multiply by the arc sine of its response. So that basically undoes the sine weight, uh, the half sine weight component. Uh, and so you can get, for within the, the, the region that is the box, in terms of the east-west position, um, you can perfectly represent location. Now the other thing that I'm showing you uh, is in terms of this orange line is the sum of squares. And you see that, you know, we know so cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. That's a useful property uh, in, because it allows for an unbiased representation. So it's not going to be that you're going to just naturally prefer some locations over others because of extra activation. And so that within this region, it's, it sums up to one. Okay. So now, this is for equally spaced. What if we have unequally spaced uh, representations? Now, all I've done is I've shown you the same basis set, but I've moved one of them. Uh, I've just moved that green one a little bit. Right? And so what are the consequences of having it be unequally spaced? Well, if in terms of our ability to recover exact locations, that blue line now has a little wiggle in it. It's not as exact. And furthermore, now we have a biased representation that will certain locations will produce overall more activity than others. So it is a useful property if you can keep things equally spaced. Now I showed you here equal spacing just in one dimension. Grid cells are they appear to be in two dimensions. Um, well how do we get at that? So let's say we have these basis sets in different allocentric directions. So that you have a basis set that's about the east to west dimension, you have another basis set that's about the north south dimension, and here's our box in which the animal is navigating. So let's say the animal is in one location and, and creates a memory, a hippocampal memory of, of what it's like in that position uh, as the memorized input. Uh, and at some other point, it's in some other location, and the question of interest then is, to what degree does that new input activate that old memory? Uh, and as a function of the Euclidean distance between them, so that's the Euclidean distance. Um, and so what you can do then is you can you can take that same activation rule that I showed you. So you take the arc sine, but now this is going to be of the dot product of the, the space set of, of half sines across. You basically just append the x and the y into your one vector across x and the y. Uh, and this is showing you as a function of, so what, what I've done here in the simulation is just taken a thousand random pairs of points uh, calculate the actual Euclidean distance, and then the activation values um, that come out of using this activation function. And up until about you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, it's, it's um, a perfect map in terms of the Euclidean distance. Now, once you get far enough away that you fall outside so these, these half sine waves, you can fall outside the realm, you know, when, once you sort of have less overlap, then you start to get all the way from the <coughs> this is a way of representing things uh, in two dimensions now. And actually, it scales up to the map. You can do this for any number of dimensions. Okay. So, so, how does the rat create these memories? You plop the rat down. You know, it creates memories. It says, I'm in this location, X and Y, and what's going on here is cool. Uh, and so, the rat, so I'm going to do simulations where we have a little virtual rat, chooses a random direction to start moving. Uh, and the, the rule is you only create a memory if, there, if it's a relatively novel location, novel situation that you find yourself in, right? So for some, he doesn't create a new memory until he's sort of sufficiently far spatially from the old memory. Now it's not that it's, uh, it, the real rule is similarity, but it happens to be that in this strange environment that has no landmarks, the only thing that's really varying is location. 
So that ends up predefining similarity. Okay, and so there's some, essentially some region, if you are sufficiently close to that old memory, you don't create a new memory. And so this already starts to create an equal placement in two dimensions. Now it's not going to be a perfect placement though, so the, the rep gets to this wall, it's more, I can't run through this wall, I'll pick a new direction to explore, and, and I randomly pet that direction. Um, and so it, once it gets outside that sort of zone of proactive interference, now it can create a new memory. And now, because of its random choices of where to navigate, um, it hasn't created equilateral triangles. And in this case, it looks like it's a right triangle that's created. But it's not in, it doesn't, um, in terms of having you know, the sufficient population code, it's sort of okay, but it's not perfect. Um, and so, what I spent a lot of time thinking about is kind of um, learning algorithms that could kind of tweak things around to, to provide better equal placement representations. Uh, and I'm going to call this simplex consolidation. Right? So a simplex is, this, is a geometric structure that has in one more vertices than the dimensions in which it lives. Right? So you know for um, for a one dimension a simplex is a line segment, two dimensions it's a it's a triangle, uh, three dimensions it's a tetrahedron. And you can have these be regular so you can have you know equilateral triangle and a regular so that's sort of the goal here. The goal is to make sure that whatever your current circumstances and your those circumstances are well surrounded by representation uh, that is you know equally far from each other in terms of a simplex, and that's what pro provides for this efficient population here. Okay, and so as the animal, let's say the animal is in this location, uh, and some some number of memories are, above, are retrieved, are above threshold. So here, these three memories are retrieved. Uh, and so that makes them eligible for, for nudges, to consolidate them. Uh, and so essentially what you do, so the rule here is, so there's the most active cell. You use feedback, strong feedback in the simulations, feedback's twice, from the hippocampus is twice what the forward is. So to reenact the perceptual inputs corresponding to that memory, and then from those perceptual inputs, those, those entorhinal inputs, you activate the, the surrounding memories. And so this becomes a way of sort of calculating distances between memories. Um, and so essentially what you do, if you see here, this memory is inside some threshold level, and this is outside some threshold. So this is sort of above threshold, that one is below the threshold. And I appeal to something that's very similar to the BCM control uh, to say that you know if if it's above threshold, then you're going to do uh, long-term depression. Uh, and so essentially you're going to move away from that one. And if it's below threshold, you're going to do long long-term depression, you're going to move towards that one. Um, I should have said one of the things I didn't really quite explain is the initial learning rule. It's just heavy in learning. You basically just set the hippocampal cell equal to its input. Very strong heavy in learning. Um, so, okay, so in terms of this kind of VCM like rule, um, what that produces, you can think about the change to the weight pattern of that winning cell. Uh, it is going to move away from number two and move towards number three. So, it's on net, it's going to move in this direction, and hopefully, you can see that that's. Moving in a direction that's towards regulation, uh, regulation. Um, and furthermore, to, to really sort of have things clean up very nicely, you, you iterate through your set of active memories. So after this one's the winner, then this one becomes the winner, then this one becomes the winner, and that regularizes. Uh, and so I have a little. This is one of these situations where a video is worth a thousand words. Uh, so let me show you how that works out. Right, so, okay, so in the simulation, we, we have, you know, there is the rack placed in the middle. Uh, it's a novel environment, it creates a memory, and it randomly starts to move. It's moving in this direction, and it gets far enough away from the original memory, so it, it now recruits a new hippocampal cell, it creates a new memory. It's still running around, makes a new memory. Now, so now we get into retrieving old memories, and now each step is just a tiny little nudge, 
the um, green one is the one that's being nudged based upon the activation of the red one. In this case, this the simplex is just a line segment. It's only two memories being activated. And I'll just plug that on for a bit. Okay, I've made a new memory. Let me get to a point. At some point, it's going to. Oh, there we have the, the triangle kind of simplex taking place. And there's these. Keep on running it. There, it's, it's regularizing that one. So they're not moving much, it's just the subtle distortions of the memories. Uh, and it happens very rapidly. You can actually just run the simulation as online recording, uh, and on, across the recording session, you will get a pattern that is a very good uh, hexagonal pattern. So it runs a little bit longer, so you can get, get some pattern. Okay, so what, the first simulation I'm going to show you here is this kind of two-dimensional situation where the only thing that varied was X and Y, and so in terms of these border cell basis sets for the east-west versus north-south, uh, and what we end up in terms of the, hip, the placement of the hippocampal cells uh, in terms of X and Y is this nice hexagonal lattice. Um, now, what we're saying here in this model is these are, this isn't the only inputs. There are a lot of other inputs. All of the things that are common to this whole navigation situation, right? So what was the time of day? Uh, what did it smell like? What was the temperature? What was the surface texture like? Who is the handler? You know, all of these things are all constant across this whole arena. So I'm going to call these context cells. Okay? And all of those are also contributing, being conjoined this two-dimensional uh, lattice. And so you can think about them, this as being a two-dimensional island in a high-dimensional space, essentially, what we have here. Uh, and so note that these are, these are, this is a two-way street, and actually the feedback is stronger than the feed forward. And so what do we get out of this? Well, so I'm going to show you the results. I'm going to start off first with the, the border cells. So in terms of those border cells, uh, and so I, I didn't, so the, the model actually doesn't it isn't a spiking model, it is a, a sort of a rate-coded model, but what we're going to say is what the spiking behavior is, right, is um, these cells don't want to be firing constantly, that's metabolically exhausting, and so they're going to fire at a, at a very uh, low rate, let's say 2% of the time, and so after letting the, animal, the virtual animal run around, we can say, you know, where, where's the sort of top 2%? Uh, and so for these border cells, the top 2% is on the border, it seems to be a little bit lumpy, uh, and actually, that's something you see in real data. Uh, and it turns out those lumps correspond to the positions of the hippocampal uh, place cells. Um, weird. Okay. PowerPoint kind of just crashed. So there's one of the, the border cells. This is the whole basis set I'm showing. There's the other border cells. You can see basically, because you have to have, to have this um, nice representation across the whole region, most of them are outside the borders. Uh, and so that's why they end up being border cells. But a few of them, and this is sort of a prediction, um, actually are sort of borders in the middle. And so that's something that, that I'd like to see physiologists can go look for. Um, so this is sort of the east-west. I don't think it likes me doing the laser pointer. 
Now, in terms of those contact cells, so there's, like I said, there'll be a lot of them, and they are all uh, receiving feedback preferentially at the locations that correspond to the retrieved uh, memories and that, that are represented by the hippocampal cells. And so on the left, I'm showing you the, the actual firing rates based again to the top 2%, and on the right, I'm showing you, you do these autocorrelation auto analysis where you shift, shift around the firing rates the light, the hexagonal pattern. Um, in terms of the hippocampal cells in the model, they're play cells. And so, um, and they actually have a little hint of uh, head, well actually I haven't done head direction. When I get to the head direction ones, they have a hint of head direction. So at this point, this is the simulation that just has the sort of two dimensions of variation. It's kind of a very short sort of allocentric version of things. Um, and so whenever you are in that location uh, that a particular place cell fires. Um, but so I started off by telling you the grid cells vary in these three properties, the spacing, orientation, and phase. I haven't told you where that comes from in terms of the model. Well, that comes from other things besides X and Y that might have varied during navigation. So the, the most obvious one is head direction. Uh, but there might be other things that weren't considered, you know, in terms of the uh, the vertical orientation, or just other thoughts that the animal is having while running around. Um, okay, so here's a simulation using the exact same model, exact same parameters, but we've stuck in another dimension. Um, I'll just show you. So, oh, sorry, over here. We have here a circular basis set of head directions, so six head direction cells. It has the same spatial properties as the linear dimensions the border cells, but it wraps around, you see the half sine waves repeat themselves. Um, and so we put that into the model, exactly the same rule, the animal runs around, uh, but now we're going to be creating these dimensions in three dimensions, the memories in three dimensions, and here's sort of the array of memories that get created, where we have x, y, and then z, and I've, I've the little squares I put in here to show you the preferred positions of these six different head direction cells. Uh, but also we imagine there's still many contact cells that are common to this whole uh, instance of navigation. And you can think at this point, this is more of an egocentric map in the sense, well, uh, you could say with a thousand egocentric, but it's basically the animal not only remembering where it was, but kind of how, which way it was oriented. Uh, if, you, if you think about it as the viewpoint from different locations, maybe that's more allocentric. But if you think about it as Oh, when I was here before, I was pointing in this direction, and that's more egocentric and more episodic in nature. Uh, so what are we going to get in this case? Um, so I should say, so these are the results. You can maybe see there's sort of hints of structure there, uh, and what is that structure going to look like? Well, at this point, rather than, you can think about the two-dimensional case as being uh, packing circles uh, into a plane, but now we're going to be packing spheres into a box. I, uh, and I, I got my daughters to help out with this. <laughs> so I had them do a little experiment. Um, so we have clementines in a target box. <laughs> uh, and we started putting clementines into the target box. Uh, and get as many clementines as you can in. Uh, so there is a first layer of clementines that we put into the box. Uh, and now we are going to create a second layer. <laughs> And probably you can see the first layer and the second layer both have a hexagonal pattern, but the second layer is actually shifted relative to the, third, the second layer, the first layer. Um, things kind of went awry once we got to the third layer. We encountered a moldy other time. <laughs> did not work so well, but that's, that's the way it goes. Um, and this is related to something called the, the Kepler conjecture. So uh, Kepler famously proposed that they're sort of uh, Essentially, it's actually two optimal ways of packing cannonballs. Um, and so, this one of them is this pyramid. 
that we see here. And so you can think about, you know, there's, okay, there's our first layer, and our first layer uh, is has a, a with an east-west orientation with a particular spacing uh, for these equilateral triangles. And we plop down the second layer, and so it's going to want to be shifted over from the first layer. Uh, and then we pack, we put down the third layer of cannibals or clementines. Uh, and now hopefully you can see that actually you have a new, when, if you're going to look through all three layers, uh, look at the projection of it, you have a new hexagonal grid. And that hexagonal grid is oriented north-south and is closer to the east-west hexagonal grid when we got when we're considering just an isolation one layer of clementines. Uh, and you can do a little bit of trigonometry to, to calculate the, sort of the, the distance between uh, one hexagonal grid and the other uh, is, is a function of the square root of three, uh, in terms of one being square root of three more tightly packed than the, than the projection. So the, at the RS and RP is referring to projection versus slice, uh, or layer versus all of the common times that we want. Um, Okay, so that's sort of what we might expect if things are being packed optimally in terms of these memories. Uh, just showing you again, with this now three-dimensional simulation, we actually get a border cell representation or responses that look much more like the real data. Uh, they sort of spread out more along the whole border. Uh, and that's because in three dimensions, there's, you can create more memories. And so there's sort of more going into the projection. Um, in terms of the context cells, it's a bit messy, just like real data, but um, you end up getting this, the uh, correlation brings out the, the hexagonal grid pattern. Uh, and I want you to note that it's fairly tightly packed, uh, and it is oriented in the east-west dimension. Um, and if we look, so now here's the key thing, if we look at the head direction cells, the head direction cells now actually are head direction grid cells. And so they, they prefer a particular head direction, but when they get memory feedback, they respond even more. Uh, so they require that sort of conjunction of the two things, if we're going to look at sort of the top 2% of the fire. Uh, and for, so, so here are these six different head direction cells. They all reveal a, an approximate grid-like pattern. Uh, that grid pattern has a, um, a that's more widely spaced. And its orientation is now in the north-south, where it is the contact cells is in the east-west. So that's with the projection versus the slice. Um, okay. And so actually, this is you see this in real data, um, and this sort of provides a new interpretation of this. Um, so it's it's known that in entering a core factor, that um, the scale and orientation co-vary. So one of the things that's been found in this literature uh, is that you find <coughs> grid spacings, so maybe four or five different discrete grid spacings when you sort of survey the cells from one animal. Uh, and so this is sort of a histogram of different uh, grid spacings uh, from the two hemispheres. Uh, and so at the same time, if we look at grid orientation, um, you see that there's particular, so the grid is, is oriented in particular ways. Uh, and if you look in the data, it, there's an approximate root tree relationship uh, in terms of grid spacing, and there's also an approximate 90 degree shift. Uh, and I'm, I'm showing you a 30 degree shift. The 30 degrees is you, um, because of these are because these are hexagonal grids. You can shift by another 60 degrees, and it's the same thing. Uh, so 90 degrees. Um, and furthermore, the ones that are these ones correspond to these ones. Uh, now, why, 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 are there, why are there more than two um, if it's sort of these, these slices versus projections? That might have to do with the animals actually remembering more than one instance of navigation. It might be the current instance, but the, these animals have experienced lots of you know, other occasions in boxes like this, and they might be remembering some of those as well. So, predictions of this account. This, the function of grid cells is not spatial and different grid cells represent different properties of episodic memory. And so that's sort of what we discovered, what the real receptive, E4 receptive fields are for these cells. Um, 
Another prediction is removal of place cell feedback should eliminate the grid pattern. And actually, this, well, this prediction has already been found. So if you inactivate the hippocampus, the, uh, the grid cell pattern goes away. And furthermore, something funny happens when you do that. The head direction grid cells become head direction cells. And so that's something that this account can make sense of. But once the memories are no longer being retrieved, they just revert back to their P4 state, which is the head direction cell. Um, and so another prediction is that hippocampal place cells should be arranged in this precise grid. Okay, so let me wrap up. Um, I presented here a unified model of spatial and episodic uh, representation in the medial temporal lobe. Um, episodes are points in high dimensional space, uh, such that you're unlikely to come back to that point in your lifetime. But even though you don't have true deja vu, um, you can remember things. And so when you remember things, it can reenact the perceptual inputs that correspond that remembered event, uh, and that memory retrieval can produce the hexagonal grid pattern that we see. Okay. Thank you. Switch to uh, discussion mode. Um, let's see. If you start with any specific questions for David. So I, I really like this for a variety of reasons. Uh, I really like this for a variety of reasons. It tickles a lot of my personal biases, so I appreciate it. Uh, one of the enduring questions in uh, the hippocampus literature. Uh, one of the enduring questions in the hippocampus literature is what its role is in animals, in, in more complicated tasks in animals that don't spend a lot of time doing spatial navigation, like <coughs> spend time doing other things. And so you must, at this point, have thought about how this mechanism would be recruited for doing non-spatial tasks. I should mention in this context, there is one uh, paper that I used to think was completely crazy, but I'm appreciating more, uh, by Tim Behrens and other people arguing for a hexagonal representation of an MRI and the MRI. Yeah, so this is an experiment we, we wanted to do, uh, and can be as good. So basically, right, so you there is this technique to use fMRI to put in spirit cells. Um, it's not an easy technique, but basically if you have animal navigating in different directions, uh, if there will be sort of preferred directions because of the, the way in which neighboring cells have the same orientation Basic. Uh, that's sort of the prediction, and you'll get this six-fold symmetry, and they indeed found it when they have people navigate spatially. What Tim Barron's did is said, okay, you know, what can you get this for other kinds of representations that aren't necessarily spatial? They're what they're kind of spatial-like. Uh, and so they had people uh, learn these different curves that have there's a two-dimensional structure based upon the neck length and leg length, uh, and they basically navigated. Uh, in this bird space by having these morph sequences where the, the neck and leg lengths change and you have to say whether or not it's going to arrive at a particular bird. Uh, and they got six-fold symmetry. And they furthermore got it not just in antrinocortex, they got it in lots of other regions as well. So we're actually actively pursuing this. We're looking at color spaces currently. So if this is sort of a general property of representations, it should, you should see something similar all over the place. Uh, and so we're looking at, at color representations and hopefully trying to get at whether or not this is a byproduct of feedback. But so yeah, it, but it will take circumstances where um, only two or three dimensions vary. That, there, that isn't going to be the sort of landmark based situation. So in in, uh, in memories that are ostensibly not typically uh, mediated, such as procedural memories, there was a common pattern of uh, errors or, or changes in performance that occur as the memories are established over over the first uh, 24 hour period and subsequently. And I'm just trying to think through this. I wonder, and you mentioned the proactive appearance of. So, I'm wondering 
given the, um, uh, the structure that you're presenting here, uh, are, are there um, uh, predictions about what are the structure of errors that should be uh, observed either during the establishment of these memories or during something of the Right, so that, I mean, so the point of this Growing effect, that it, 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 very right. sort of interference. Right. I mean, so the, the sort of stated purpose of this consolidation algorithm is to create this regularization, but it is distorting things. And so there's a prediction that things will be sort of initially more veridical, uh, and that after sufficient consolidation, you, know, you can also imagine offline consolidation as well, just constantly tweaking these memories to allow for a more efficient population code, and then you will progressively get these kind of systematic distortions. Um, yeah. Now, in terms of, uh, but you were, but you were mentioning sort of early on errors. Right. Um, yeah, so I guess for I'm, instance, you learn a procedure, and then the performance of that procedure is poor in the evening, and then subsequently the recovers right. after. The right. Population. So I guess I would say that might have more to do with the creation of the population. So it's, in, in terms of you, you, if you if your initial placement of the representations is not well placed. You'll have that kind of biased representation, like I mentioned, uh, and it won't, you won't be as good at efficiently recovering. So, in some sense, it's more critical, and in another sense, it might lead to errors. Yeah. Uh, how to get at the behavior? I don't know. So, I understand the idea of the trying to the simplex to make things more regular, grid-like. You motivated that from the idea that you had a decoder of a certain form that you were not going to allow to change this signed thing, right? So that then gives you free generalization on that decoder because you don't need to retune it. And if that seemed to be your motivation, then you're just trading that for the need to mess around to build this regular lattice and the animal to explore the entire grid to build the grid cell, it seemed to me. Where the usual argument goes, the grid cell is itself built by the structure of the network, and that provides the free generalization. Is, is that a fair yeah, description fair. about the alternative views of where you believe the generalization mechanisms are going to come in? Is that right? it's, it's whether, you know, it's, the debate will become which of those is the more efficient way to do things. And how is efficiency defined here? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the uh, thank you for the, the insightful ideas and just one thing I want to point out from this big figure we're presenting right now is that uh, when you see their supplementary video uh, you, you may realize that the actual processing in the bird space the panel B is not aligned with the animal grid cell so they just um, collect the directions into the center and they uh, align that directions into that um, the circular shape of things, and they say the, uh, the neural process starting to the end point is aligned to that 60 degree hexagonal shape. Um, they found those kind of brain activity patterns. The human that's there talking about. So it's a little bit off from the animal free cell. The concept of animal free cell is like whenever animal reach that specific area of the space, that's cell reliers. So it's okay, so, so, so actually this has to do, um, this has to do with why it's six degrees, I mean six, the six-fold symmetry. Uh, it basically has to do with, as you move through the grid pattern, whether you are, through, it's lining up and you're hitting the hot spots versus you're off angle. And so not hitting as many or as frequently the hot spots. And so, if that's the reason you get the six-fold symmetry, it shouldn't matter kind of where your starting point uh, or any point is, but rather would be the angular trajectory that you're taking in the space. So, so in this sense, there's a chance that the, what is it, in the, move, the movement in the bird space is not in the uh, hotspot, in the animal grid cell, but still they can see that hexagonal six-fold brain activity. So it's maybe. Well, so, so the, the claim that, 
this, this um, model that I propose is applied to these data would say that there is some, well, there's some multidimensional representation of these birds, but the birds only vary in terms of neck and leg length. And so that you have this regular uh, equilateral triangle lattice of birds, of bird representation. And that as you see this morph stream, you are moving in that space. And if the morph stream has the right angle, it, it's more of a hot spot. Uh, so at this time, maybe uh, Russ or Randy could join us in the front for a group discussion. I suggest that Russ, Russ didn't have a chance to question. Yeah. Russ, I was going to suggest we start there, too. Maybe sit down. Any specific questions for Russ that weren't addressed over coffee, or did you want to tell us your coda about uh, coffee? Yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I. There's a psychological literature um, on uh, our spatial knowledge, right? Um, and uh, that suggests that our spatial knowledge is more complex than just sort of like a sheet of graph paper. Um, you know, how we have representations that seem uh, grouped into hierarchies and things like that. Um, and so, um, I mean, this is a little better slides, but what I'm suggesting is, is that uh, we need to figure out uh, how that type of information uh, is incorporated into these more graphical representations. And I think some of what I showed you in the retrosplenial region uh, it gives you some hint about how that might kind of happen because I showed you that the representation for one museum sort of applies to the other museum. So, so there's sort of like a schematic representation that can be applied to multiple sub environments. So, um, you know, so I, uh, that was, I think cognitive maps are, are more than just, you know, a single uh, Euclidean metrics that they these other uh, sort of structural uh, elements and we're at the point where we can think about how those are encoded. Right? Okay, any questions for our panel? I, I'd like to comment a little bit on when I say the navigation, I'm, um, the literature on the animal, I'm constantly struck by how similar everything is to conventional navigation that you're taught if you go to a school there, right? And just picking up on what you were just saying, no one navigates in Long Island Sound on a chart of the North Atlantic. Yeah. Uh, that is, uh, yeah. uh, and, and when you get into a harbor, there's always a, you turn, your, you got a book of maps and you leave the map you've been navigating on and you turn to uh, inset A on page 35 where they have a map of a harbor, right? Because uh, when you're navigating the harbor, you're working on an entirely different scale than when you're trying to get in the harbor. So again, I think, yeah, of course, the, the cognitive map has itself a complex hierarchical yeah. structure. Yeah. So my question has to do with exactly with that. So how, how can different things be kind of modified to accommodate various scales? So, um, so, and I started thinking about Dan's presentation yesterday of changes in intrinsic excitability, and I think that can certainly be one way of, of doing that, right? So, what you need is some gain control on that map or some kind of normalization factor, something, so that the same map can be used in, in, in different ways. You can kind of zoom in, zoom out, and it seems that changing intrinsic excitability of cells could be one way of accomplishing that, as opposed to RNA. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's what the scale factor in a, in a fixed point number is about, right? It's the changing the scale. <laughs> so, um, um, it seems that the one thing that ties all these three together um, and is a question that was similar to a question that was posed to the is how are symbols represented? And um, it seems that the answer is, uh, this may get in part the problem of numerosity, uh, is that uh, symbols are represented topographically. So nearby concepts 
are somehow spatially or spatial functionally nearby. Right? And we see that we make errors. Uh, when we make errors, they're not random, but they have some structure. The errors have structure. So I'm wondering if the, I don't know how much this helps with the uh, computing with symbols. So how do we compute the symbols? Not quite sure yet. But if they are uh, topographically organized, then, for instance, they should be interacting with each other through lateral and territory mechanisms, and that generates some potential way to do computation with them. And uh, does that help, uh, I tread lightly here, but does that help to start to address the question of the numerosity or uh, we, we have to learn, right? We don't, we aren't born in this lesson. Tell me otherwise. But uh, we all went to the school where we learned how to do algebra. Uh, algebra. My uh, brain has been doing uh, linear algebra since the Cambrian, <laughs> in my view. Okay. Uh, and that closeness is an inherent property of a vector, right? That is one of the most basic computations, right? It's the magnet. <laughs> that is, you've got two vectors, it's trivial to say, well, this, they're closer, they're far apart. Yeah. I, do you, do you want to comment? Uh, it's as far as I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, was, I, I want to ask Randy a question uh, in terms of this proposal of, of RNA. Yeah. So, then the, so if, if uh, Action potentials are so metabolically expensive. expensive. Why do we have so many? What are they doing? <laughs> so, on, on my view, the nervous system is exactly like the internet. Uh, the memory and all the uh, uh, all the computations being done intracellularly. The cells are the servers, and the signaling is all about updating memory. Uh, and so they're. They're busy signaling each other because they're busy set, uh, sharing the contents of their memory. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, about the presentation from Dr. Epstein. Um, uh, in your uh, presentation file, it tells us that it's more egocentric rather than allocentric. But there is another notion that there's a sex difference in special navigation. Like a male more from the allocentric way and female more from the egocentric way. And in that case, do you have any, did you see any sex difference in the animal? Uh, yeah, I am uh, constitutionally opposed to uh, sex differences because I think, um, I, I'm sure they exist. Um, I, I think they're a uh, the, uh, pathway to uh, unwanted publicity. Um, <laughs> so, but a more direct answer to your question, um, you know, we did have in our study half males, half females, um, but you know, then you don't have a whole lot of power to look at uh, sex differences. Um, so we didn't find uh, anything obvious. Um, and I, I do think that although there may be slight uh, differences between the sexes, um, you know, um, those are probably going to in comparison to the overall structure of the system, which I suspect is, you know, very similar. Um, one thing that uh, would be a next stage to look at um, that we didn't look at is that people vary quite a bit, like hugely, in terms of their navigational uh, ability. So, um, you know, the tasks that uh, I gave to these subjects, uh, you know, many people probably would find it very difficult uh, to do. So uh, I think looking at the range of individual differences, yeah, as a function of baseline navigational ability, um, would be uh, something interesting to look at. Because I don't think like everyone, everyone's retrospinial region um, could necessarily solve uh, this task. You know, even just the ability to keep track of your heading uh, in the environment uh, is something that um, some people do very very well and is natural to them, and some people can't do at all. Um, the uh, you know, when I said, look, you know, I, if I need to figure out what, where north is, you know, it's basically that way. I mean, 
I mean, I, I keep track of that. Um, I'm not sure if everyone in this room would feel confident in, in giving an answer. Yeah, so, uh, so that's the, I, I would be more interested in, in looking at just uh, not sex differences, but you know, just a range of navigational ability, which by the way is something that people can estimate quite well. Um, you, if you just ask people, you know, um, how, well, how good is your sense of direction uh, rated from one to seven, um, people's ratings uh, will correlate quite well with objective measures. So. And there's a one other quick question. And uh, how do you think about the size of the problem that do you think you can cover this room, or this building, or the city, or the country? Yeah, so going, yeah. I mean, I we have at least some evidence that some of the representations uh, we see, like in the Retrospolino region, are. Uh, flexible with regard to scale. So I think that there is some flexibility. So, um, you know, the representation you might have on the scale of this room might easily be expanded um, to, be, uh, to the campus, at least with regard to um, understanding directions uh, between uh, different points. Um, so um, when it comes to sort of a location, um, I am skeptical that you know, the cognitive map, the sort of Euclidean graph paper can be expanded much over a much larger uh, space. I mean, my prejudice, which I think Randy will disagree with this, is that, you know, once you start thinking about what's the relationship between like this campus and like downtown New Brunswick and New York City, that basically you kind of end up with a, a, a patchwork um, and that that is uh, more likely connected by some kind of vectorial uh, representation. Uh, where it's like, I, I understand the direction between, the rough distance between these two uh, maps. And, uh, you know, and then it's a sort of different thing when I'm actually in that space. I just wanted to follow up in terms of the sort of egocentric versus allocentric. One thing that I was struck by with your, uh, with the museum task, is that essentially it's like a radio arm maze, right? So they had to, all the doors were aimed towards the central location, and you never asked them, to navigate out in the environment between two points. Uh, and so related to like the, bee, the bees do that all the time. Sure. So they're, they're going to be forced to learn the allocentric map. And so I wonder you know, yeah. if you use a different task. Um, and um, I certainly uh, I, I certainly believe it's the case and that um, if people are trained such that they understand better the relationship between the points in that larger environment, and what you'll see in the Regislino region is a more global representation of that space. So, and we've seen that in other experiments. So basically it has this like it has this flexibility. It's not like it's like rigid and it's like, oh, I can only represent what's within these walls, you know, and then uh, what's outside the walls are, are represented elsewhere. So, so a lot of that has to do with, you know, just uh, what people how how well people learn the environment and what they learned about the environment. So um, I, I, I loved your talk, Matthew, and I just, especially the part about the affordances. And so I wondered if you could, I think there's probably a little tension between you and Randy um, on, uh, on the matter of, of whether or not knowledge of space in some ways requires an explicit representation in geometry, or whether it requires something like, I call, would call a provisional affordance, you know, not the sense that you just, you know, you have to walk through something, but it has that meaning to you as an affordance. And, um, and so um, in, time, in terms of relating even numerosity uh, to um, the same structures in the brain that, in other words, the superior parietal cortex that allow us to sort of know things about where things are relative, relative to us, I, 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 I guess I'm encouraging you to take a position that is almost anti-representational, except that, except that, of course, the provisional affordances have to be represented. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I like the word affordances, but in the end, I, I actually do believe that, you know, that they're just a, maybe another way of thinking about uh, geometry. I, I, I'm not sure that they're really uh, that different, at least in the uh, real world uh, environment. Um, so it's just a, I, mean, I just think of it as like a more sort of more fine uh, grain uh, version of uh, geometry, but one that maybe relies a bit on our high level knowledge, which I think is interesting. So it's very salient to me that there's a door um, over there, uh, and 
you know, that is not necessarily something that jumps out in the shape of the room uh, any more than like these, these windows. Um, but because I have, you know, knowledge of the way things are, um, of, of the way rooms work, then that actually, I think effectively, you know, does kind of become uh, a, a representation of my geometry of the room, even though it's, it's not just, you know, the, the points of the surfaces, it's, you know, becomes a little bit more high level. Thanks very much. Very interesting talks. Um, I'm curious about this idea of coming back to the number representation or number coding in the brain being through uh, RNA. And I'm wondering, um, I have trouble conceptualizing how that would work. And so I'm trying to think of an experiment that could be done which could provide evidence and support or falsify that idea. So what would be uh, an experiment that could tell you, ah, uh, that's a coding, you could you know, disrupt the RNA in such a way that that function would fail, but the cells would pro function properly otherwise, or all the non-navigation facilities would be all right? So, uh, of course, uh, that's the question, and, and of course, you're not alone in having trouble conceptualizing how this uh, would work. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to communicate is that I don't think, no matter what you imagine the substrate of the memory might be, it's hard to conceptualize how it would work. That is, uh, I say, okay, you like plastic synapses, fine, tell me a story with plastic synapses. But, um, to address your question about the, uh, the uh, what kind of experiment can one do, uh, there was a paper published from uh, the University of Lund uh, in the PNAS back in 2014 or 2015, in which they demonstrated, uh, to my mind, beyond reasonable argument, that the duration of the CSUS interval in eye blink conditioning was stored intrinsically in individual Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. And to me, if I were a young molecular biologist, I'd say, there's my Nobel Prize, right? <laughs> because now we have a preparation in which we can control the inputs. We know what we're looking for. We're looking for a structural change somewhere intrinsic to that cell that actually encodes the duration of that interval. Right? So we're, we're looking for something very specific, right? And, and we'd know when we found it if we said, look, you tell me the change in this molecule, I'll tell you what the interval was that the cell was trained with, right? And vice versa. I'll tell you the interval that the cell is trained with, and, uh, and uh, you can predict what uh, the molecular change will be inside the cell. So that to me is the start of the answer to your question. That tells us what, if we found that, if we could do that, I would die in peace. I wanted to know the physical basis of memory since I was 20 years old, right? I don't think it's gonna happen in my lifetime, but if I see an article reporting that result, I would say, that's it, we found it. And so uh, that's what we're looking for. Uh, but we have to see something where we can say, yes, this change encodes that fact. And when you frame it that way, the simplest kinds of facts are the numerical facts. Uh, the quantities. Over here. Um, so, I hope that this is a little rambling because I'm having a hard time getting idea straight in my head, but one of the things that a couple of these talks made me think of is this idea that what play cells are doing are not representing points in some Cartesian space, but something about the topology of the space, right? So they're, they're representing like, like an, each play cell is an open set, and you're tiling the space or in sets, which um, David Huber's talk uh, seems like very similar to that. It seems like a kind of a learning mechanism in which you can learn sort of tiling of whatever space you have. Um, so I wonder if you could, you guys could talk about what you think that, um, whether, whether you think that, that, that the, the representation has to be spatial or if that's just a consequence of the fact that you're learning, 
you know, some kind of efficient tiling or efficient parcelation of a two-dimensional manual that happens to be spatial but could be anything. Yeah, I mean, so I think that's sort of the, the idea in, in the model I proposed. The, the tiling happens because the animal's navigating in this two-dimensional space and visits all of those locations. Now, if if the thing that you were learning was not space, it would depend whether or not you actually explored all of that representation. You might, you know, if if instead it's what you're you're memorizing is a story. Well, the, and and the, then you're you're varying the semantic inputs, and and you know and have certain patterns that you're memorizing that correspond to the different words in the story. Well, you're not going to actually explore the space fully. <laughs> uh, space is vast. Then instead, you're going to have one particular trajectory through this vast semantic space, and that's all you're going to have. And so you're not going to tile then. You're just going to have a, a road, if you will. I have a question for you guys. This is maybe most easily expressed with regard to Randy's talk, but I think it applies to all three of you and maybe also to Dan's talk yesterday. So if you're storing information intracellularly, where you've got some specific subset of all the cells in the brain or all the regions in the brain that are responsible for storing this memory and retrieving it later, then you also have to have some kind of addressing system so you know what cell has got the information you need. Uh, and especially when you start going to highly intracellular things like mRNA, it's really unclear uh, from first principles what that address system would be, and whether you need a parallel system for that. I was hoping you guys could comment on, on that. Well, you need a random access memory like you see in DNA. Um, that's part of that. That is, as you surely know, uh, <laughs> All genes have two parts, right? And just like a, a registered memory has two parts. It has an address and it has a coding portion. And every gene has uh, a coding portion and it has an address. So if you were doing empirically based memories, I, I think the very fact that that architecture is seen both in hereditary information and in these machines that we've only created in the last few decades uh, tells me that when it comes to addressing your question, and it's a fundamental question, right? There's no point writing to memory if you can't find what you've written. Uh, and you don't want to have to sort through, <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to have to have a tape, right? <laughs> tape is a disaster in the long run. So you want a random access memory, and we see it in both DNA and in computer memory. And what we also see is the very clever use of building data structures by using indirect addressing. And we see that again, and that is, that's how you get genes for an eye. One of the most stunning discoveries in my scientific lifetime was when they, they, these Germans discovered there was a gene for an eye. When, when I was taught genetics, that wasn't possible. Genes code for proteins, they didn't code for for eyes, right? Now, how could you have a gene for an eye? Well, that gene doesn't code for a protein that appears anywhere in the eye. It, it codes for an address, right? It codes for a transcription factor that gives access to other genes, almost all of which also code for transcription factors. You have to go quite a ways down in that data hierarchy before you get to the genes that actually code for the proteins that actually appear structurally in the eye. And this is identical to what goes on in, in uh, computer memory. That's how you build data, data structures in computer memory. So I would have to assume that this intracellular molecular machinery that I'm fantasizing about has this bipartite uh, structure. Now, in the coffee, you asked me, could the locus of the individual synapses uh, be part of this story? And I think, oh, for sure. That is, why not exploit that? Do, right? So you can have little pockets of memory at each uh, synapse, and they could be specific to that synapse. I guess I should make it clear. When I say it's not synaptic, I only mean the synapse as traditionally uh, conceived, namely as something whose alteration empirically can be represented by a single scalar, a weight change, right? I'm, uh, the, the mechanisms I'm fantasizing about might very well be located intrinsically in the membranes in the immediately around the, the synapse. And of course you might, the system might very well exploit the localization at synapses. In fact, in the cerebellar Purkinje cell, which has this 
staggering dendritic tree, right, on which 200,000 different parallel fibers end. It, it's looking at me so, whoa, this cell must care about which fiber is uh, tweaking it. Well, I certainly don't have an answer to the addressing question. But, um, you know, when I hear Randy talk about this, and I, I think about this relationship to uh, my own work, one thing I, I think about is, um, you know, what are the parts of the system that require this sort of, you know, Van Neumann machine, uh, you know, random access memory computational uh, system? And what are the parts of the system that don't require that, right? So I think, uh, you know, we have pretty good models of the visual system, these convolutional neural networks, uh, you know, can do an awful lot, and they don't require this mechanism. They're just something that over time you sort of learn synaptic weights and these features are abstracted. But at some point, you know, then you got to do something else. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe that's a question to you, Randy. It's, it's like, what's, what's, you know, what part of the brain required this uh, mechanism that, uh, you know, you, you this uh, computational mechanism? What parts of the brain can we just think about in terms of, you know, our sort of traditional, uh, our traditional network uh, models? I'm such a <laughs> radical here. I mean, I think all parts. Uh, so, John has these fantastic data that show that at the very first olfactory synapse, there's already, well, you correct by this stuff, but the, the uh, if you've trained his mice that odor one predicts shock and odor two which is similar in odor space to odor uh, one, doesn't predict shock. If you get enhanced transmitter release to odor one from the first order neurons. Now, uh, how could that be? Well, of course, there's an obvious story, which is probably a true story, which is this is uh, uh, real-time feedback from higher levels of the nervous system, right? Because uh, there's a, as we all know, but we don't know how to think about it, there's more uh, feedback in the nervous system than there is feed forward. Uh, so that's the simple and probably the true story, but in my uh, more radical moments, I think, no, 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 <laughs> this predictive relationship has been commuted at higher levels and shipped out to the uh, soldiers out there in the front line, right, the sensory neurons of the thing. They, that's what enables this uh, enhanced release. So, on the strong form of this, look, once you've got something as powerful as memory, uh, you put it everywhere. Every single neuron is uh, making use of it. Uh, Brian Wandell works with the computer engineers at, uh, at Stanford, and, and he, he thinks, one of these people who thinks I'm not totally crazy. And uh, he, uh, he commented, he, he was working with them on image st stabilization in cameras, right? And they were just discussing how could, might we do this, various analog systems and so on. But one of the engineers commented, he said, you know, we talk all the time about what we're going to do about this, but what we always do is add memory. <laughs> and as I think Oral agrees, it's almost impossible to uh, overestimate the importance of memory in computation, right? Uh, the reason you always add memory is because memory always helps. Uh, it, 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 it's useful for everything, including <coughs> last-minute motor corrections and interpreting <coughs> of sensory information. So one of the recurring themes here is this distinction between encoding versus decoding. Uh, and uh, so you, you mentioned convolutional neural networks, and so they seem to be forward. And I'm sort of imagining that you know the decoding that there there is. It's related to feedback. Uh, and there's actually, I think, implicit in the success of convolutional neural networks is decoding. So they often use the back propagation algorithm, which is not plausible. But uh, uh, so, so my uh, postdoc advisor, um, Randy O'Reilly, he developed this, it's called the generalized recirculation algorithm, that basically produces the same results as back prop um, in a more plausible way. But the way it does it is it by comparing a, a forward pass to a backward pass. And so it could be that you know, these algorithms actually are you know, they're doing the same thing, they just don't actually do the decode, explicitly do it, but they're implicitly included in it. Well, this is sort of related to John's question and, and, and uh, Russ and Randy's uh, answer. 
I mean, um, in, in terms of the addressing problem, it seems to me that the structure of the nervous system does, in some sense, uh, provide uh, uh, the map. Uh, you mentioned, uh, in, in, in terms of John's work, that you speculate that, in fact, uh, this first sensory synapse may actually uh, contain the sort of, if you will, the template uh, information for recognizing a threatening uh, odor. Uh, it may be downloaded there. That seems to make um, sense in that it gives you speed and you don't have to wait for some something uh, yes, yes. central. Um, so that speaks to the issue of, well, you have to add memory. Well, you add it where you, both in the sense of efficiency, but also in the sense of speed. Right? Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so what that means is that memory, which is encoding something, the, the numerosity or some factual thing, for instance, the uh, interval for Kinji cell, well, yes, that for Kinji cell, many inputs, but still, the click or the whatever oh, yeah. does land on that for Kinji cell. Uh, yeah, and it does connect out. Because of the 200,000. Parallel yes, and it does project out ultimately to control the eye link. Um, so that in a sense, the addressing problem within the pathways for at least simple input-output relationships is solved by the structure of the nervous system. And the memory is in the cell that does the job. Totally agree. Well, that sounds like a good note to end on. We can go get some lunch. I'm going to go some applause for our panel, please. And we'll reconvene. Uh